I saw that email I sent out to uh, South London to uh, Carthy. I say, when did you send it yesterday? Sunday. Sunday morning. Sunday? Yeah, I did. Did you get it? Um, So, um, right. you know, when, um, when we were registering with the state of California, Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. We're waiting a couple more minutes for the uh, last ones to get in and then we'll get going. Good 
this. Is Mr. Tomlinson in yet? Yes, I'm here. I had a little trouble with my. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Thank you. Thanks for joining Good, us, thank Robert. You. Thank you. I had a little trouble joining. Here I am. All right. And this is Secure Air. Bob's our guest of honor today, everybody. So. All right. Mark Mastriani, you want to start us off? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our wildfire presentation. We're going to have a couple of presenters going through our slide deck, and then uh, Dr. Erith is also going to have Mr. Tomlinson answer a few questions for us, and then Mr. Stamatados will also continue the conversation with everyone. If you have any questions, you'd like to type them into our chat. We'll address them at the end of the conversation, and uh, we're ready to go whenever Dr. Erith is ready to start. Yeah, do you want to go ahead and um, um, open up the, the slide deck and present that? Second, it's loading. Well, good morning. I'll go ahead and um, uh, get started. Can we? Uh, is is it is still loading? I think is that correct? It is. Yeah, I'm just trying to share yeah. it. Give me one yeah. moment. No worries. So, uh, for everybody's uh, uh, information, my name is Mark Arith, and I'm very pleased uh, to serve as the uh, chief medical officer here at Secure Air, and um, have spent quite a bit of time in the last five years, actually pre-COVID looking at the health consequences of uh, poor indoor air and poor ambient air that we are all faced with uh, outside from time to time, especially during wildfire seasons. Um, we have with us today, Mr. Bob uh, Tomlinson. Bob is a professional engineer and uh, was one of the, the chiefs involved in, uh, in taking care of uh, University of California Davis Hospital uh, and we'll uh, we'll have a few questions for Bob as as we as we move on. Um, I think what we should do is uh, as we're as we're kind of getting started here, um, I'd like to uh, just preface things with we've all heard about wildfires. Um, you know, uh, I just yesterday I heard about some 110 degree temps uh, in parts of Portugal. And the fact that they now have uh, significant wildfires there in Portugal, as well as in other parts of in in parts of Spain and elsewhere in Europe, and uh, we know that um, also that even the forests in Finland, which are quite far north, have have taken a hit from some of these temperatures. And irrespective of what you think about climate change or um, or uh, fossil fuels, there's just no question that um, we are seeing an expansion of wildfire seasons. Uh, they tend to start earlier and go later than usual. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we're certainly seeing um, a lot of the health consequences from wildfires and from combustion from all sources. And when I think about combustion and I think about air pollution, Again, separate of climate change or separate of that discussion, if I look at it from a health perspective, we know that approximately 10 million people on this planet every year are dying from the health consequences of uh, combustion and air pollution, okay? Um, the other thing that we know is that we're seeing um, a large number of, uh, of uh, you know, diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, stroke, heart attacks, all of them being tied back to uh, particulate air pollution. 
And in addition to that, we know that Stanford University uh, researchers have recently published uh, data on the fact that uh, short intrauterine exposures. So let's think about this. This is pregnant moms who are exposed to wildfire smoke for short periods of time uh, during pregnancy have actually uh, resulted in uh, a number of uh, complications of pregnancy, such as preterm birth, uh, low birth weight. And I think what's really important is in those babies, once they're born, um, they've actually had long-term pulmonary or lung problems, as well as immune system function problems. And some of those, you know, it's early on in this research, so we don't know what the follow-up is gonna be like, but if you've got a newborn with an immune problem and with a lung problem, uh, we know that those lungs, the diaphragm, the breathing mechanisms in newborns is not fully developed for another six or seven months after birth. And so we're really handicapping uh, these moms and the young babies that, that they're delivering when they have been exposed uh, to wildfires. Um, any, uh, any progress on our slides yet? Still share, sharing, I'm uh, loading, it's still loading. Okay, sounds good. You know, I'm gonna jump into some discussion with Mr. Tomlinson. Okay, here we go, great. There Thank you so are. much, Mark. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and move on to that next slide. Hang on. So, so he, this is a common scene now, right? I mean, we are seeing uh, large numbers of wildfires we know that in the last four years in California, we've had a couple of million plus acre wildfires that have uh, ravaged uh, and uh, ravaged that state and uh, have certainly, uh, as a result, caused large, large uh, plumes of smoke that then migrate uh, a far distance. Would you like to advance the slide, please, Mark? Yeah, so so here's, that here's wildfires uh, from uh, from our 10 year average and we can see, you know, they are up around 50%. Let's go to the next slide. And I can tell you from personal experience last summer that if you've got a wildfire here centered in Northern Utah, that you can see uh, that smoke plume uh, and those ultra fine particulates spreading throughout in this case, a third of the United States, of the Western United States. And we in Minnesota last year uh, experienced uh, 11 days of record uh, breaking uh, uh, poor air quality from the Ontario wildfires that were just a couple hundred miles away. But we had 11 days almost all in a row where we had uh, air quality index numbers that were up in the 400s. And that's a really bad number for us, okay? So uh, nonetheless, we know that wildfires are bad. We know they're increasing. And that if you're trying to protect your customers, your family members, or in the case of hospitals, uh, as a clinician, my patients and the staff that I work with, we're going to need to rely upon something that's going to really clear ultrafine particles. Mr. Tomlinson, I know you have a hard stop at 1230 or 30 minutes after the hour, rather. So I'd like to uh, ask you a couple of questions at this point. And first of all, uh, Bob, tell us where you are located and tell us a little bit about what you experienced last summer with your wildfire season. Well, thank you and I'm glad to meet everyone. A mechanical engineer with uh, too many years of experience as I, as I age. Um, I'm here in Sacramento. I actually live in Folsom, which is about 20 miles east of Sacramento. And uh, I've been in this area for 20 years. Uh, obviously, I lived in. I always had fires in California and, and terrible dense smoke uh, comes over populated areas. Up here in Northern California, when the smoke comes in, it settles in the valley with with an inversion layer like smog does in Southern California, and it just sits in there thick almost like fog and the, the last and I too have been a supporter of secure air before COVID uh, for a number of reasons but I got to experience its benefit and its use in the last couple of wildfire seasons my wife said to me so far so good this year we haven't had smoke so thick that you can see it and live through it we haven't had a big one here 
We had a little ones nearby. We could see some smoke, but the last couple of years, it was very thick. Um, I was, d during the last five years, I was principal engineer at UC Davis Medical Center. And I started promoting secure, I started uh, before COVID doing an indoor air quality assessment of the whole campus and wanted to, in some of our compounding pharmacies to reduce particles. So we actually did a test with uh, Secure Air, one of their portable units, and it showed significant reductions of, uh, of submicron par particles in our, our, our pharmacy. And that was just before COVID hit. And then we started doing more tests. And prior to that test, which is December, what, 2019, because COVID hit about January 2020. Yep, that's um, right. The year before that in 2018 was a big smoke year. And we had a big smoke event and we immediately started closing interior doors, trying to stop the migration of smoke into the internal of the building. I walked the whole campus and some some buildings smelled of smoke deep inside the buildings, others didn't. And we brought in a secure air uh, portable unit and uh, put it in our office and we were close to the outside door so the smoke had penetrated into our office we were close enough to the outside smoke could come in you could smell it yeah. put that thing in there and it was running for two or three days the smoke event lasts for weeks i mean these big smoke events here in sacramento the way it settles in like a smog they don't sit there for two or three weeks especially when the fire's burning my boss walked by the office and he says wow that thing really works because our little office no longer smelled like smoke. And I was glad to hear him say that. Follow on on that story, when COVID hit, we started testing it and our environmental health and safety group bought two of the units, the portable units. I was also promoting putting the units in the air handling units for one of our buildings. And it didn't get in, honestly, because a contractor who was in charge of the budget said, what's the return on investment? And I said, better health, and it just didn't get in. Since then, UC Davis has moved beyond that, and they have a new medical office building that's under design and construction right now, and secure air units are going to go into that air handling unit. And since COVID and wildfire smoke, at least UC Davis, because they've had so much experience with secure air, sees it as doing both, sees it as keeping indoor air quality better, which further reduce the risk of transfer of airborne pathogens, but also uh, saving the space from smoke. So they're gonna put it in one of their main buildings. It should be operational about 18 months from now. Looking forward to that. Since leaving UC Davis, I've come back to the MEP consulting world. Now I'm working for Glam Glumac. Glumac was the design engineer for an office building in downtown, the O Street building. And they put in secure air in those air handlers. And we're monitoring the PM 2.5 concentration. And it's showing excellent results in that building. Uh, so that's kind of a quick summary of, of uh, my experience with secure air. And secure air has other papers and other facilities where they protect it against wildfire smoke. but when my boss who you know was been a maintenance engineer for 25 years yeah. seeing all sorts of technology when he walked by at that office and says wow that thing really works that sold him yeah uh, so that's, that's, that's my uh my summary of my experience with secure air that's that's really impressive bob and and we certainly appreciate that uh, that insight um so I think uh, a, a couple of things that Mr. Tomlinson talked about. First, he, he talked about a compounding pharmacy. And for those of you that may not know what that is, uh, inside hospitals typically is where they're located. And these are the sterile environments where, where intravenous solutions are made that either are used for feeding patients, like if they don't have the ability to process nutrients or can't take food uh, orally, uh, then uh, we feed them through the intravenous line. And so 
by definition, that of course has to be a sterile fluid. The other thing is that when we think about cancer medications that are given, and many of these cancer patients, of course, are immunocompromised. So sterility in the preparation in this compounding pharmacy is really critical. And so count, compounding pharmacies uh, are certainly well regulated, but uh, most importantly is they can be the source of infectious outbreaks in hospitals. And we have seen this uh, in a number of set settings and uh, where secure air has come in. And uh, not only is it important to show that we can drop particle counts, but I think what's really neat is uh, a number of the independent uh, studies and work that's been done elsewhere in hospitals is that they've actually documented a reduction in microbial load with secure air, thereby returning uh, a previously clean uh, compounding pharmacy that got contaminated and then led to infections, thereby returning it back to a, a clean environment. And so uh, we believe, and, and certainly the data that we at Secure Air have not collected, uh, certainly uh, warrants and suggests that uh, uh, there is no question that we can have a very positive impact on a compounding pharmacy. When I think also about uh, pathogens, uh, we just talked about microbes in compounding pharmacies, but it also applies, Bob, you suggested that um, you know, pathogen reduction is a very important part of, of maintaining air quality within healthcare facilities. And, you know, we're here to talk about wildfires today, but, you know, we all want to have pathogen reduction in any of our environments. We don't want excessive microbes, whether it's COVID, whether it's bacteria, or whether it's other viruses. We don't want excessive pathogens uh, in that circulating air within our buildings. And certainly we're, we're tickled to hear about that uh, that recent building that's online where you're measuring where yeah, we're going to we're measuring it. And, and yep, UC please. Davis Health, because of their uh, experience with success of secure air in a wildfire smoke condition. I mean, I was there. The building was smoky and. It had entered our building and got into our office, and we put in a secure air unit, and it it it, uh, it changed the whole condition of our office, kind of because of that and because of the uh, better air quality. Yeah. They have decided to put it at the air handling units in this new, it's an ambulatory surgery uh, building. It's an Oshpot 3 building, and it's, uh, so you call it an ambulatory surgery building. It's a four-story building. It's a major building on UC Davis's campus. Yeah. And they're putting secure air there for two reasons. One, to prevent, to um, protect the space from wildfire smoke, and two, to reduce the indoor air quality, to improve indoor air quality. Yeah. Uh, and that's that that decision, getting a a semi-public organization to make a decision like that. It was really based on their experience over time with secure air at the yeah. compounding pharmacy, and then in smoke-related events. So that, that's exciting and uh, very exciting. Uh, and I Bob, look can forward I ask to seeing a that question. Board. Can I ask you a question? It, it, it seems to me I recall that one of your buildings or perhaps the main building um, uh, may have a very high amount of fresh air. And we've certainly seen some applications where, um, you know, hospitals will have 100 percent fresh air. Intake. Yeah, we have a couple of buildings. Our main patient tower, 14th Third Building, it's 100% outside air, and they have heat recovery coils. Uh, sure. But they they justify it from from a health point of view. Well, we want to use 100% outside air. It uses a lot of energy, but they have heat recovery uh, yeah. coils. Um, so regardless, that's 100% outside air. So what we did in that building in the wildfire event, one, you have to shut interior doors. So the smoke, it might come into your front lobby, but you don't want it to migrate deep into the hospital. Um, but then we went to the outside air filters and we attached a, a one inch layer of carbon filtration as a temporary mode during wildfire smokes. So that actually became part of the policy. Interesting. Um, so so in, when we think about hospitals with 100% fresh air, that certainly is good from a standpoint of uh, infection, right? Because I'm moving a lot yep. of fresh air through the building yes. and yes. I'm reducing the microbial load just from dilution alone. Yes. We yes. also certainly know that that some viruses and microbes remain suspended almost indefinitely. They're yeah, not really moved it's, by it's, air. Yeah, exactly. And and yeah. 
uh, I'm a little frustrated with uh, ASHRAE and uh, all the committees because every time we get something new like this that comes around, they study it and they come up with the same answers. More outside air and more filters. It's like <laughs> that's all they come up with. Yeah. And a secure air and it's a particle acceleration technology is attacking the particles that stay resident in the space. Even in an operating room, there's still particles in the space because they're not affected by airflow. Introducing secure air into that air handling unit will cause those particles to coag coagulate and remove. So in, in my view, it's an enhanced uh, particle reduction technology. And it's a game changer because otherwise you're just adding more impingement filters and you're bringing in more outside air and even when you bring 100 percent outside air into space there's still resonant particles you still got particles in space yeah. so if you bring in a particle reduction technology that reduces the particles then you've got a more effective uh hvac system and um i think well, it's a game changer it's it's interesting also right because Yes, 100% uh, outside air is really great from a standpoint of infection control. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, the expense is on energy, as you just mentioned. Right. But as I think of it, too, is as you showed, you've got 100% outside air coming in, and the smoke was getting in the building, oh, the yeah, wildfire yeah. smoke. And so then you had to retrofit and try to come up with a temporary carbon uh, solution. Now, of course, yeah. that drove up energy uh, expenditure, too, because you got to pull across yeah those carbon yeah. filters that you had, that carbon yeah. media. And, and, and it helps some, and and uh, at least in that patient tower, for some reason, the smoke didn't migrate. And we have filters that, that remove some of the smoke, but in the emergency department, which is two floors, 100% outside air, that smoke migrated into that space. I walked the whole space during these smoke events. I had two of them while I was there. And it was interesting how some spaces, and I asked the nurses, I said, do you smell smoke? And she goes, yes, and I couldn't smell it. And and if you know ASHRAE, um, there's some bias about that, but females have better olfactory scents than males <laughs> do typically. And yeah, that's, sure. a, that's a physiological thing. And so, you know, I'd always ask the nurses and the females on the floor, do you smell smoke? And if they say yes, then I trust them on that. Um, anyways, that emergency room had a lot of smoke and it would have been great to have secure air on that unit and, and, mm -hmm. and we didn't. Bob, have you, have you come across other technology that you think is as effective as secure air or other technology mm -hmm. combinations that have been as effective? No, I haven't. Um, you know, I started down this path of looking at secure air way back in the eighties. There was this product called Causatron. And it, it 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 kind of had the same general theory of, of working. And a lot of engineers in Southern California bought into it and uh, put it in um, some casinos in Las Vegas, because back then you could smoke in these casinos. Mm -hmm. And I remember going into one of these casinos with this Causatron unit, this was in the 80s. And you know, if you're in a smoking area, a lot of smoke, and you have a jacket on, and you go back yeah. to your hotel room, yeah. and you smell that jacket, it smells like smoke. Yeah. Well, with this unit in place on one of these casinos, that didn't happen. Somehow, it didn't attach to your jacket. So I was impressed with that. Um, and years later, I've always looked for what I'll call uh, advanced particle reduction technologies. And uh, many years later, became familiar with Secure Air. I was looking for opportunities to put it in place. And uh, once I got to UC Davis and I started this whole indoor air quality study, things came together. And as far as other technologies, um, we've looked at some other technologies, but um, we tried to test another technology uh, and I just wasn't given a real test chamber that I could do it well. So it didn't show very well. Um, you really have to field test this equipment. Yeah, that's exactly right. Field testing is so important and that's what we advocate, getting out there putting in a, a, a temporary solution or a portable solution, measuring particle counts. When I first met Frank Stamatados five years ago, it was we measure and we verify. And uh, 
uh, it's been a good watchword. I wonder if we could just take a moment um, before, Bob, you have to leave in about three or four minutes, I think. Right. Um, yes. Do we have any other questions from the group for Mr. Tomlinson or Frank? Do you have a question you'd like to pose? Uh, no question, just just like to thank you, Bob. Uh, appreciate the comments and uh, your help at UC Davis um, was out, has been outstanding. Yes, yes. Well, I look forward to uh, specifying secure air and more solutions uh, for better indoor quality and protection against wildfire smoke. So, so uh, I've seen it happen and I'm very uh, satisfied as an engineer with the technology and I wish you all the best. Now I'm going to go go to a client and look at if they want to replace some boilers. I don't know why the boilers are only five years old and they're real nice, but somehow they don't think they work. So I'm off to take care of another client and some boilers. <laughs> Thanks again, Bob. We really Talk appreciate you your time. You have a great Bye, day everyone. And, and blessings you, for a, a low wildfire season. OK, yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so very much. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see if there, are, if you can go to the next slide, please, um, Mark. So, when we think about healthcare, um, you know, we always talk about populations. I mean, healthcare is very personal to me and to my family, certainly to all of you and your families. But also, as a clinician, we th like to think about populations. And so, what are the at-risk populations that are at risk for wildfire smoke exposure? And, you know, we know that a whopping 37 million people in this country have a chronic lung condition. I have a member of my family with a chronic lung condition. And so we are very, very sensitive to wildfire smoke. Um, we certainly know that allergies are really common and they're getting more common as time goes on. You know, 20 percent of our population have allergies, uh, the respiratory allergies, not just skin allergies, but respiratory allergies. And as I alluded to earlier, uh, with the, the help of the Stanford researchers, we know that women and babies are very susceptible. We also know that young children, you know, your brain's not developed until you're in your 20s. And we know that especially in those first five years of life, your brain is rapidly developing and changing. And we know that uh, wildfire smoke causes cognitive delay. We know that wildfire smoke and that cognitive delay is not just in the elderly, but that's also in the very, very young. And so these younger populations are at high risk and they are very unique risks sometimes. Next slide, please. So how can you protect you and your family? How can your customers and clients protect themselves? Well, it's really important to understand your risk. And there are a lot of various wildfire and air quality index apps available. You can pull them up on your smartphone and uh, you can put, you know, identify uh, uh, location based results where they can give you your location specific information and certainly send you uh, notices or information. And, and what it, what are you going to do with that information? Well, certainly if you've got a high uh, air quality index day with very poor quality air, that's a good day to kind of keep the kids indoors, perhaps, as opposed to have them outside uh, actively exercising and, and playing outside and then save those days for when the air quality is better outside. Certainly uh, limit some of your activities, if you, especially if you've got a chronic health condition. Well, maybe the, today's not the day to mow the lawn or today's not the day to chop some firewood. Uh, well, I guess today's <laughs> it's talking about chopping firewood. You're going to burn firewood and cause more combustion. But let's say some other outdoor uh, activity. Maybe today, if the air quality is really bad, it's not the day to paint the exterior of your home. Wait a couple of days, okay? And so that's something, one of the things that you can do. Let's advance the slide, please, Mark. And then okay, the second Jeff, thing. Jeff Curtis has a quick question for us. He just raised his hand. Jeff? Jeff, please. Thank you. Hi, hi Mark. Good morning, everyone. Um, Jeff from Golden Valley, Minnesota. Um, Mark, um, fantastic presentation so far. I just want to make sure, I want to back up to the um, those at risk slide. Um, yes. And, and I think you touched it, but I just want to amplify again, you know, people living in areas where they're more susceptible to pollution, I think is something that is a, is a high risk category. Um, so I think in that 37 minute, thank you for that slide, that's great. Um, pregnant women, babies, children, but I think also those living in areas 
where there's near highways, um, in concrete jungles, areas like that, we shouldn't gloss over. So I, I, I thank you for that comment uh, uh, and statement, uh, uh, Jeff. Thank you very much. Um, Jeff's exactly right. We know that the first person that ever had their death attributed, the first child that had their death attributed to air pollution was a nine-year-old girl in London who lived in eastern London. And uh, literally her apartment building was right next to a major highway. And she spent a series of days just prior to her death outside playing in the playground, literally 100 feet or 30 meters uh, from this uh, this very large uh, highway system. And so, uh, as Jeff, as you just said, we have a large number of our population that are uh, very vulnerable, living close to uh, uh, places that generate a lot of particulates. And it's not just the particulates that come from combustion, but we also know that, um, uh, you know, braking systems in vehicles, all vehicles, uh, including electric vehicles, uh, braking systems release very large quantities of ultra, ultra fine particles. And those particles are just like the ones that come from combustion. They're easily inhaled. And when they're inhaled, they go out to the periphery of your lungs. And that's where they cross the capillaries, get into your bloodstream. And that's where they stimulate the chronic inflammation that causes brain disease, that ca causes vascular disease, that causes heart disease and stroke. So, Jeff, thank you very much for reminding me. And and, and these people are, are very vulnerable populations as well uh, in that they're disadvantaged in many ways. And so uh, they get a double whammy. So thanks, Jeff. So, um, you know, we were just talking about 100% fresh air in the hospital, right? And of course, we like to open our windows to ventilate. And with COVID, that's what everybody was saying. Open your windows. Let's get some fresh air. Well, that's great for, again, infectious disease. But if you've got a wildfire, you're going to have to close your windows, close your doors. Uh, certainly, if you have available an N95, that's going to help uh, prevent uh, uh, you uh, inhaling some. It's not going to prevent all of those fine particles from getting in, and you've got to wear an N N95 nice and tight. And make sure that you've got a, a good seal. But if you're out and about, that's something certainly to think of. And then, um, as, uh, as EPA also tells us, let's look at proven methods that can control indoor air pollution. And certainly we're here to talk about secure air. We're not, uh, we're not shy about it because we have a lot of third party studies published in medical journals that show that we have proven that our technology uh, is not only uh, safe in that we don't generate ozone, but also it's highly effective at reducing particle counts, uh, reducing microbial loads. And for those of you that may not know, we were able to reduce hospital associated infections by 45% in 124 bed post acute care pediatric hospital on Long Island. Um, and so we have, again, third party uh, conducted studies published in medical journals that prove that uh, our technology works. So, again, we're not shy about it because we've got better numbers than any other technology out there. Mark, let's go ahead. Um, this was uh, a result of, uh, you know, we hear a lot of people talk about HEPA filtration. HEPA filtration is highly effective. Remember, HEPA filters are really good about uh, uh, capturing very small particles uh, when you look at before and after uh, that filter media. Uh, we went up against uh, a HEPA filtrated operating room in one of our studies. In a HEPA filtrated operating room, we were able to go and reduce uh, airborne particulates within that operating room by an additional 95%. So we bested HEPA and, and reduced uh, particle counts significantly lower uh, than just a normal HEPA uh, filtration system. Let's go to the next slide. So maybe, Frank, would you like to jump in here and, uh, uh, and maybe ask a few questions or provide a little uh, uh, insight here? Well, I'm always happy to provide some insight and, of course, uh, some some opinions. Um, it, but it all goes back to how do you prove that it works? What's the measurement criteria? And how do you know? So for me, it's always been in measurement. 
performance is tied directly to measurement. And as Bob Tomlinson stated, and I think Frank Wagner can also tell you that at the O Street project in Northern California, they're measuring some of the lowest counts on record in a public building. Wow. So it's all in, does it work or does it not work? If you're looking to check a box, if your customers are looking to check a box and say that we've put an indoor air quality solution and we've installed it, but they don't measure it post installation, that's not a client for secure air. So measurement, verification of performance. If that's what you're interested in, that's where secure air, I believe, shines. Yeah. And relative to studies, um, we're going to continue to say it until somebody else has a clinically published study that proves that the technology actually creates better patient outcomes. It's not there. So to me, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, Frank's exactly right. We're, Frank, you're exactly right. We're, we're not really aware of any other technology that um, actually has uh, clinical outcomes where they've measured, uh, you know, a, a, a decrement in um, infections, you know. I mean, certainly there's a lot of small chamber studies, you know, one foot cubic chamber studies or room size chamber studies that may show a reduction in particles or a reduction in microbes. But when we take that and apply it to a real world setting, you know, and if, if any of you out there, we've got 50 some of us uh, on this call today, if anybody knows of any real world studies uh, on existing tech, uh, on other technology uh, that has shown a reduction in infection, please let me know because I haven't seen any yet. So we've got a video here that I think we can play just a minute or so long, kind of gives us a little information on, on how in fact Secure Air works. I don't hear the audio coming through. So I think what uh, our, our commentator is saying is that we know that when you're at five microns or higher, those particles are carried away by airflow, but it's those smaller ones that are most deadly that uh, don't make it into the airstream because they don't have enough mass. And that's where, as we said earlier, they, they're taken in into your lungs and they make, it, make their way into your bloodstream. Here we know that these ultrafine particles that are not affected by airflow uh, are, are coagulated as a result of the uh, active particle control technology. And those microbes, when they then get to our electric field, our high voltage uh, electric field, they are uh, then uh, killed by oxidation. And so we know that uh, uh, secure air works. We've, uh, we can measure it in the physics lab. We can measure it with our particle counters, and we certainly measured it with clinical outcomes. Go ahead and advance that, please, Mark. So certainly we also know that, look, you know, one of the things that we hear a lot about uh, is an anti-COVID solution, right? What's going to take care of COVID or what's going to take care of a particle or what's going to take care of a volatile organic compound? And I think what's important is that uh, what we know is that our technology is agnostic. And so not only do we take care of uh, bacteria, viruses, including COVID and fungi, we certainly uh, are able to remove uh, allergen and irritants from the uh, breathing zone space. And when we say breathing zone, I think that's important too. We have another study that we're just about to publish on, um, on secure air's uh, benefit in an exercising facility. 
90 active exercising clients within a 12,000 uh, square foot exercising facility in New York. And we were able to significantly reduce particle counts, but also microbial loads. And those microbial loads were measured in the breathing zone. You know, I don't care what's happening at the ceiling. I don't necessarily care what's really happening at the floor. What I really care about as a clinician is what is in that breathing zone that I'm inhaling. And so um, uh, this is one of the benefits of secure air is we treat breathing zone air more effective than anything else I'm aware of. Next slide, please, Mark. This is uh, uh, some of the information that comes from some of the, the, the reference that, uh, that Bob was referring to. We know that here we are uh, in 2020, they had the worst air quality in the world. And we know that in fact, baseline particle counts, you can see there in gray, significantly, significantly reduced uh, with, uh, with secure air technology. Next slide, please. So I think this is a good time for some questions and answers. You've all been really patient with us. I really appreciate uh, the chance to speak with you all. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Frank, I'll, I'll hand it back to you for questions, either from the floor or that you may have yourself. So any, any, oh, we got a, we got a Jeff. I'll go. I'll go. <laughs> I, I'm here. <laughs> hey, um, awesome presentation again. Maybe this one's for Frank. Frank, can you speak to the um, the high performance aspect of the solution? Um, I'm going to back it up a little bit to where we started, and that's where the climate conversation. Which, Mark, thank you for starting there. Um, we're seeing, and and, and we're, many of us here in Minnesota across the world are looking at better ways to heat and cool our homes with less impact. Um, the heat pump quickly sh is the shining light here. Um, heat pumps that I'm talking about are not the, your grandfather's heat pump. They're the heat pumps of today and tomorrow. The inverter um, constantly running, a low CFM, um, really exciting stuff to me. Can you speak about the performance of Secure Air on all systems um, and how it incorporates there? Yeah, so I think um, what you're referring to there is the unique ability of a secure air system to operate at very low static pressures. So uh, low static pressure in an HVAC system uh, is, of course, extremely important. And, and as we push the envelope to higher efficiency, how do you accomplish that? Right. If you look at standard paper filters, efficiency doesn't increase without a static pressure increase. So if you're operating new state-of-the-art compressors or systems that actually operate at lower flows, how do you keep that system operating for as long as you can without causing loss of flow? And the answer is low static pressure. Low static pressure with high efficiency. And, and that's, that's a unique component of the secure air system. So thank, thanks, Jeff, for the question. The, the answer is the secure air system really is a single indoor air quality solution that addresses a lot of concerns. I mean, the, the forest fire smoke concern uh, we heard last week, um, I think Jay is on, Jay's on the call. Uh, we spoke with uh, the Ordain Museum, which is located at the base of Whistler Mountain. So it's in a pretty nice spot. And during their forest fire events over the last couple of years, um, one of the um, uh, operations folks shared with us that it was nice not to breathe smoke within the museum facility when as soon as you walked out the door, it hits you right square in the face. So again, performance, measured performance, 
Um, that's that that's really what we're all about. Uh, Mr. Bill, please. Hi there. It's Frank. Frank Wagner wants to talk. But the one thing that I think we're we're missing in our discussion is the fact that with the neutral neutral particles do not have the ability to be played out on heat transfer surface. The cooling coil is a wet cooling coil is less filter in an HVAC system. The systems we have, the amount of deposition is reduced by 90, 98 to 99 percent, which means you don't need UV code, UV systems on coils uh, because the coils stay clean. The duct, the supplier duct stays clean. Your supply diffuser stays clean. You don't get the ring around the diffuser. And those particles behave as neutral. Therefore, there's no affinity to play out. This is a big deal in HVAC systems because you know, the, the standard, standard thought is to put UV lights on coils. Uh, my, my, my comment is how do the coils get dirty? How can your fan blades be black? Because everything goes through the typical filters of the pathway, and nothing creates a neutral particle. We do, and that's that's something that uh, that that's one of our sales pitch. In the fact that that neutral particle in a 100% outside air system, and uh, you know, in California we don't have anything called fresh air. We have 100% outside air systems. We have a 88,000 cfm 100% outside air system in wildfire situations. Using our systems on the outside air intake, so there was not one hint of wildfire smoke or odor in the ICUs or the OR in this one hospital we, we put that in. So the, the other thing we talked about sterile compounding pharmacy. We just are afraid to get into a, to a pharmacy which had a bacterial contamination in their pharmacy. Just a little EOS 100 unit. They put it in their sterile compounding pharmacy, but then they came back in the morning and the Pharmacy was contaminant free. Uh, their 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 measurements, not ours. They bring in their industrial hygienists because sterile compounding things you don't want to bacterial contamination and and IV. So uh, when people say is there another system that works, check a box. No, there is, and there won't be because their base passive filters were active. We reduce that position and our continues our system goes out in the occupied space. Coalescence collides, absorbs as those particles, and either it's exhausted on 100% outside system or it's returned to the system for inactivation. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> well, we don't want you to stick to it. We want you to be neutral. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing is in California, you have to, uh, the new systems are required to be a MERV 13. In many existing facilities, they put in MERV 13 filters on package units. Uh, you see, they split heat exchangers on the gas side because of low airflow, and they burned up compressors. So some of the schools just have these MERV 13 boxes, just let the teachers think that they're, that's what they're using, and they put in MERV 8. So we have a big election learned here tomorrow on MERV 13 with 0.1 pressure drop. Nobody else has it. Nobody else can get it. And it's the other thing is, you know, we it's nice to have a MERV 13, but it's really nice to have the entire technology of control, collision, capture, and activation, and transport, and reaction and deposition. So this this new a uh, slimline unit is cast me out. It's it's really well done and easily shown because it works and it fits in anybody's package. Here. So go sell it. Any other questions? Final thoughts, Dr. Earth? My final thoughts are, why wouldn't you want simple technology that delivers um, a comprehensive solution in an energy efficient fashion that has based on proven third party studies? I don't know. That's what I've got for my house and my uh, second home. 
That's what I want for the operating rooms where I'm having my surgery done someday. And that's certainly want, uh, what I want for the schools where my grandkids will go to someday. Yeah, and uh, I don't want to take the thunder away from our steel, but um, they were one of the first companies that um, came up with the why not quote it on every job? Let somebody take it out. Because then the liability is no longer on you. That to me makes a lot of sense. Indoor air quality, if you have bad indoor air quality, you notice it. But when it's good, <laughs> right? Nobody worries about it. One additional thing which we talk to engineers about is living up to the standard of care and following best practices. In California, there's a 10 year statute of limitation on latent defects. If the technology exists to reduce file fire smoke and you do not employ it, then you are, you know, you haven't followed the reasonable man says you're following best practices. You therefore in California have a requirement to put it in at your expense. And this is this is a telling thing. We've changed out the millions of dollars of cooling towers and put the wrong cooling power in. And the general contractor uh, it, uh, has a lot of heartburn when he's writing a $2 million check to change out some packaged cooling towers and put it into good cooling towers. Same thing is in effect for air purification. There was a study, and California is a prime example. Climate change doesn't have much to do with wildfire smoke. It's all been forced mismanagement over the last hundred years. And having been a firefighter for 25 years, when you go into a forest fire, there's four feet of debris on the forest floor. It's on fire. And uh, so it's just forest mismanagement, which we can't we can correct by managing forests and better. But at the same time, uh, you know, it is what it is. You got to mitigate it as a source, as a source. And in California, if you use charcoal filters, uh, you have to put in a fire suppression system because it's so flammable. And the fire department <laughs> catches you putting in a big carbon system without smoke or without a fire suppression system, he will shut your building down. That solves the problem of indoor air quality because there's nobody indoors. They're all at home. So there's 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 a lot of the bureaucrats are now coming to to their senses that you you cannot put a bandage on gangrene. Sometimes you just got to get rid of it. And putting putting sheets of charcoal on a, on a outside air insulation. Bill and I wrote one. They put cardboard over the outside air intake. Well, that that's good. So, uh, you know, it's just these people do desperate people do dumb things. And when wildfire smoke hits, get rid of it with secure air. That's that's in our house, that's in our fire. We're at a fire station right now. And we have it running there. So that's it. Okay, so I think we're just about uh, five minutes early. So we'll we'll happily give you back five minutes to your day um, if there are no more questions. Um, we we have recorded the session. Uh, it will be available online and uh, as well as the slide deck. Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you, Mark. Yep. Jeff, thanks, thanks for your, for your questions. Time, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Nice work. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, guys.